Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Lewandowski from LabCorp, and today I'm going to be talking about our large-scale SARS-CoV-2 sequencing project. LabCorp is a leading diagnostic testing company with collection sites across the country. To supplement our patient centers, we also offer the Pixel at-home collection kits, which expand our national reach. Amongst our diverse testing portfolio, we offer molecular RT-PCR testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. To coordinate our widespread testing, we have a national laboratory information system that tracks each sample starting at the collection from a patient to the transportation to testing centers to processing within testing centers and eventual reporting of results. This LIM system allows us to locate all the samples every lab receives and also allows us to tie patient metadata to those samples. In addition to our ability to acquire and track samples from across the country, LabCorp has a few advantages that put us in a very powerful position to perform high-resolution pathogen surveillance. The samples from across the country are clinically relevant. These are not cultured or heavily processed samples. These samples are taken directly from patients and then handled, stored, and transported appropriately. The samples we collect represent circulating virus in the population. As I mentioned previously, we tie relevant metadata to each sample. This metadata includes geographical information, such as the state and zip code, temporal information, such as when the sample was collected, patient information, such as age and gender, and information to help with sequencing, such as the relative concentration of the viral nucleic acid. In addition to the sample quality, we also have a lot of experience with high throughput sequencing and experience rapidly automating new tests to accommodate large-scale sample processing. To summarize, using the combined powers of LabCorp, we have the ability to sequence clinically relevant samples from across the country with high-resolution metadata, and we can do this on the scale to, of tens of thousands of samples. These figures show our national reach and the sample pool available to us in R&D. The animated figures have the number of unique positive samples in each zip code over time. The size and color of the circle is representative of the number of samples in each zip code that has samples. On the left of the slide is a cumulative total. On the right, we have sort of a live tracker of the pandemic. In this figure, after a sample appears in our database, it is removed after two weeks. We assume that after two weeks, the patient is either recovered or immobilized and not spreading the virus, so this kind of tracks the circulating outbreak. As you can see, LabCorp has over 1.5 million positive samples with fairly decent coverage across the United States. Although we potentially have access to over a million samples, there are logistical challenges that prevent the R&D group from procuring all of those samples. These figures show the samples that have been archived and are stored in the R&D freezers. We have amazing lab directors, specifically Dr. Howard Engler, Dr. Andrea Troop, and Dr. Suzanne Dale, that were willing to help out with this project and send samples to me in Burlington. But at certain points in time, their labs were overwhelmed and they didn't have resources to send samples. Now, I'm located in Burlington, therefore I was able to go into our Mid-Atlantic lab and grab samples myself. Due to these circumstances, the samples are biased towards the Mid-Atlantic region. I need to point out that the data in this map ends in July, at which point we had 73,000 samples archived. That is the point at which I became overwhelmed and couldn't keep archiving, but I was still collecting samples. We have between 5,000 and 20,000 more samples from across the country in our freezer waiting to be archived, with hundreds to thousands more coming in each week. Now, obtaining, categorizing, and archiving about 100,000 samples from across our laboratory network is no small feat, so I'd like to go over the process a little. This slide shows a normal laboratory pathway for our COVID-19 samples undergoing molecular testing. The raw sample is aliquoted into a plate to be processed on an automated extraction instrument. The total nucleic acid is extracted into a standard 96-volt plate. This material will be used as a template for the RT-PCR assay. Typically, once each sample on the extraction plate has a formal result and the plate is no longer needed, it is discarded. This is where our sequencing process steps in. Instead of collecting tens of thousands of raw samples that we need to extract, we take these remnant extraction plates that would be discarded and utilize them. The R&D lab developed custom data mining algorithms that allow us to process the extraction plates on automated liquid handlers to select only high value positive samples that we can sequence. With this critical step, we go from tens of thousands of plates with mixed samples to a more manageable few thousand plates of purely positive samples. Now that we have these plates of ready-to-use nucleic acid, we can start working on sequencing. For our assay, we sequence the entire length of the viral genome by using two pools of 15 1.2 kb overlapping amplicons. After the tiled amplification reactions, we combine the pools and perform library preparation to sequence the samples on a Pacific Biosciences SQL2. We are currently sequencing between 600 to 1,000 samples per smart cell with circular consensus sequence reads. Using this method and the Pacific Biosciences SQL2, we're getting very high resolution consensus sequences for each sample that span the entire genome and do not contain any gaps. Combining the diversity of our samples geographically and temporally with the high resolution full viral genomes, we're able to detect new mutations and variants in the population as they appear. This will become very important in the future as vaccines are widely implemented and the virus faces significant immune pressure that could result in new mutations. 
Although we haven't sequenced all the samples in our archive, we are off to a good start. Thus far, we have good quality sequences for about 6,700 samples. Those samples were collected from the population between the middle of March to the middle of May. The sequences were processed in Nextclade, which gave us some really good metrics to use for the visualizations I'm about to show. And to be clear, all of the genomes in our database were compared to the SARS-CoV-2 Wuhan isolate with the NCBI reference on the bottom of the slide. I'm gonna start showing some of the first ways we've been looking at the data and some of the things we were capable of visualizing. This slide is showing nucleotide mutations across the SARS-CoV-2 genome. We have a table on the left with the top 15 mutations in our database so far with the frequency of each. On the right is a bar chart of the total nucleotide mutations across the entire genome present in our database. It is no surprise that the site with the most amount of mutations is at around 23,000, which is the site of the well-noted D614G spike protein mutation. At about 6,700 genomes in our database, about 4,700 samples, or about 71%, have a mutation at this position. This data is very informative, but as I mentioned before, all of our samples had a lot of metadata attached to them, which allows us to dive even deeper into the analysis. This figure shows the individual nucleotide mutations across the genome accumulated over time. I think it is very important for me to mention again that the Pacific Biosciences Instrument allows us to use large tiled amplicons to fully cover the viral genome. We should not be missing any new mutations that could potentially be missed with short read amplicon method. This makes the figure and the style of analysis not only visually fascinating, but scientifically relevant. We also have the ability to set thresholds to see if there are mutations appearing in clinically relevant areas of the virus. This slide is an example of doing just that. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP, is a complex of proteins the SARS-CoV-2 virus uses for the replication of its genome, as well as the transcriptions of its genes. This complex is pharmacologically important because of its interaction with nucleoside analog inhibitors, such as remdesivir. The RDRP complex is made up of three subunits, NSP7, 8, and 12. NSP7 and 8 are next to each other on the genome, so we can look for mutations in them in one chart. NSP12 is a little way away, so we have to look at that separately. As you can see from the charts, there is a highly prevalent mutation in NSP12 and some lower prevalent mutations in NSP7 and 8. Now, we can do this for specific targets, but also flag a rise in mutation frequency independently of location as well. We can also look at the groups of amino acid mutants per virus in our database. This table has the top 15 amino acid mutations that occur together in a virus, as well as the frequency in our database. As you can see, out of about 6,700 genomes, about 8% have this top grouping of amino acid mutations. As expected, most mutations have the SD614G mutation, but interestingly, less than 2% have only the SD614G mutation. We can also break things down by individual amino acid mutations. On the left of the slide are the top individual amino acid mutations seen in our database so far. As expected, the D614G mutation in the spike protein is the most common, with about 71% of the samples having it. We also have the ability to break down amino acid mutations in each gene, and the table on the right does that. This table represents the total individual amino acid mutations in the S gene. It's fairly obvious that the D614G mutation has the highest frequency, but it's certainly not the only mutation we see multiple times in this gene. Again, we have the metadata to look at things over time. This figure shows the individual amino acid mutations across the S gene over time. Now, we can also set thresholds here to flag any mutation that crosses you know, a certain raw count limit or is at a frequency that could cause concern. We can also represent the data geographically over time using metadata attached to each sample. In this map, the blue or cyan circles are the D614G negative or D or wild type viruses, and the red circles represent D614G positive or the G mutant. The size of the circle relates to the number of samples in the zip code. As you can see, when we track the D614G mutants geographically and temporally, we can see the D614G mutants spreading across the country. Next clade also gives us information about the clades of each viral sequence. This map shows the distribution over time of the SARS-CoV-2 viral clades. As you can see, we have a lot of data that we're generating and analyzing, but there is still a very, very long way to go. We have many more samples to sequence. What we have is a great start, but we have almost 20,000 archived samples from before March 15th from across the country. This sample set from early on in the pandemic will give us a high-definition look at when and where specific genotypes came into the country and establish a baseline to track viral evolution over time. We are also planning on sequencing the new samples that we received to enhance the global efforts of pathogen surveillance. Something that is very important to us as well is to analyzing the sequences using Nextrain to look at genomic epidemiology. The samples we receive have the viral nucleic acid present, 
But keep in mind, these samples were collected from patients. The swabs used to collect the samples will also retain some of the host cells as well, allowing us to sequence host genomic material after we've used what we need for viral sequencing. Our HLA group will start with performing HLA typing on each of the positive samples, and we're also utilizing existing genome-wide association studies to investigate potential relationships with other host genes of interest. I'd like to acknowledge a number of people that have helped with this project. Scott Parker developed the tiled amplification library preparation for the assay. Thanks to him, we now have a very robust and standardized method for the wet lab work. Kim Wagner is our automation specialist. She worked with me to align our in-house algorithms with our liquid handlers to make this project possible. Ayla Burns and Dr. Sahanik helped develop and validate the SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR assay that we took samples from. John Pruitt has been helping Scott out with processing samples for our sequencing. Dr. Urban has been helping with the GWAS study reviews and host genomic portion of this project. Dr. Zhang has done a lot of work processing and analyzing the sequencing information coming off of SQL2. Dr. Iyer processed the viral genomes through NextClade and gave me the mutation and clade information to make the visualizations in the presentation. Dr. Zeng and Dr. Iyer are part of the bioinformatics group led by Dr. Lotovsky, who has given this project a tremendous amount of support. Brian Norville and Dr. Williams run the SQL2 and are developing the host genomic portion of this project at LabCorp. I have to give an enormous thank you to the Pacific Biosciences team from getting us the SQL2 and setting it up in record time to the tremendous help with troubleshooting and lending expertise and analyzing the data. We are extremely fortunate to be collaborating with them on this project. I have to give the biggest thank you to my boss, Dr. Kruger, and LabCorp CSO, Dr. Eisenberg. We initially thought we were going to get a few hundred to a couple of thousand samples. As the lab started accumulating tens of thousands of samples, this project became much bigger than I expected, and both Dr. Kruger and Dr. Eisenberg were extremely supportive and encouraging. I'm Dr. Mike Lewandowski. Thank you very much for your time.